This is the Tom Bigby Tales, and I'm your host, Shannon Evans. This episode is titled MUW, Alienating Alumni and the Potential for Long-Term Damage. In the recent Mississippi University for Women, or MUW, renaming process, it was interesting to see two different factions at work online. Men wanting to silence women with dissenting voices and against behaviors from the younger super liberal and anti-conformist conformists. Study after study showed that women are more likely to have their thoughts, ideas, and opinions discounted and dismissed than men. Nowhere was that made clearer than when I questioned the director of enrollment about any research done to back up the position of the university that students did not enroll there based on the university's name. I asked once and was met with anecdotal information. I asked a second time and was told there was no study and how would the university even measure such information? As someone who has worked in institutional research in this area, I said, it is possible and I can even show you how. However, I was immediately met with, who are you and what is your connection to the university? I responded that I was a third generation graduate and I held an undergraduate and a graduate degree from the W and also have returned to Columbus, Mississippi, where the university is located, to live and asked, who was he? He blocked me. What an interesting outcome. No ugly words on my part. No insults. Only questions to probe for understanding. He couldn't silence me, so he blocked me. How interesting. He eventually unblocked me when someone told him I had screen captures of the entire event before the blocking. Again, how interesting. Then came a letter to the editor of a local paper about my dissension, my probative questions and concerns about fake profiles and clone profiles being used by someone or someone's to sway public opinion, to be pro-genderless name change. The entire letter was an excellent example of an ad hominem ageist attack that did nothing but appear petty and displayed stereotypical prejudice and biased attitudes. But that is all a distraction. At the moment, the Mississippi legislature, sorry, that is all a distraction. The Mississippi legislature never got to vote on the Winbridge part of the renaming process. The proposed bill for renaming never got out of the University Committee on Education because it could not even get a second. Three times the W has now tried to rebrand in recent years. Three times they failed. Twice in a month span. That some egg the president, Nora Miller, now has on her face, along with that of the marketing team and the renaming committee. But why is the W in dire straits? And why does it think that without a name change, it has its future? But more importantly, why did they wait so long to tell the alumni that they were in dire straits and one year away from the uh, enrollment cliff that all universities are worried about. Recently, I walked around the campus, and I walked around the campus again this morning with a a bigger eye to what's going on. Two large historic dorms and the old Orr Chapel smack in the middle and front of the campus are still unusable after the 2019 storm that ripped through Columbus. Peyton and Fant Hall are massive old dorms, I've heard that the School of Nursing is to take over FANT, possibly restore it. However, it does have a wall that needs um, shoring up before it collapses. That would give the nursing program, the largest program on campus, even more room to expand. The old gym and auditorium that's in front of FANT Hall is also locked up and mostly an eyesore and totally closed or is hugely historic and has been left to rot. Then there's Painter Hall, where I took English, Latin, and history courses and often sought refuge to read and study in the old student lounge back in the 1990s. Painter looks like it has not been painted or had any window panes recalked 
refinished, or replaced since 1998 when I graduated. The new dorms in the back of the campus were new in the late 1960s, King Cannon and Jones. And while the W was concerned with renaming the school and avoiding gendered or problematic historic names, it still has a dorm, Jones Hall, named for a former Confederate officer. Dr. Richard Jones was a prominent professor of mathematics who taught at the Industrial Institute, which is now called MUW. He also taught at Ole Miss, Randolph-Macon in Virginia, Petersburg Female College in Virginia, where he served as president, Martha Washington College, Mississippi State, and Emory and Henry. Jones had risen to prominence in the Confederate Army before teaching and attained the rank of major. It would seem the renaming for troublesome history could possibly start there with that dorm. Perhaps more troubling is the general lack of security in that dorm and the rest of the campus. Perhaps that's the bigger problem with the school. The front gate is never manned. There's no evidence of security, which is which is never seen actively patrolling campus, and the lack of emergency blue light type systems for student safety and faculty safety, and darn few cameras make the school's overall safety a general concern for many new students and certainly for their parents. Personal property theft from students' cars is commonplace, especially for commuters. Since parking is an issue for commuter and resident students, the few existing parking lots have deep craters that are deep enough to do serious damage to car tires and the undercarriages of those same cars. The buildings and their parking lots adjacent to campus that house community theater and education programs are poorly lit and also have a general rundown appearance. Many of those parking lots have a hot patch in places to repair the frequently occurring potholes. This is deeply concerning that the campus looks overall so run down. With so many colleges facing the enrollment cliff in a year, predicted the enrollment cliff is a predicted significant population decrease of 18-year-olds entering college in one year. It's no wonder the W is concerned about viability. The W and several Mississippi HBCUs are on the precipice of extinction or absorption. Delta State University in Cleveland MUW in Columbus, Alcorn State, Mississippi Valley State, all are under consideration for closure. Alcorn State, <clears throat> each of these schools, including Alcorn State, have had significant decline in enrollment and have lower four-year graduation rates than the state. Delta State has a 23% graduation rate in four years. Mississippi Valley State is a 16% graduation rate after four years. Alcorn is at 25 and MUW is 35.6, noticeably notably larger than Southern University. However, Southern catches up in the six-year rate and the W flags considerably behind. The Mississippi legislature is not renowned for being pro-post-secondary education unless it has to do with their own alma mater, which is generally Mississippi State or Ole Miss. So it should come as no surprise that there's a bill before the Senate, Bill number 2726, calling for the closure of three institutions of higher learning by 2028, with a decision to come by June 30th, 2025. Granted, this bill may never make it out of committee and to the floor. However, it is a partisan bill, a Republican bill, and Mississippi is a strong Republican state. And it is most likely aimed at two of the HBCUs and the W. The bill was introduced <clears throat> on what appears to be the very same day <clears throat> the W renaming bill died an unseconded death 
Is this a coincidence? Maybe. But on about the same day, a bill was proposed to move MSMS, the Mississippi School for Math and Science, to Mississippi State University. But let's explore Bill 2726, proposed by Senator John Polk from Hattiesburg, a representative of the 44th District. He's a graduate of Southern Miss and has been a senator since 2012, and he sits on the Education Committee, among others, including the Committee for universities and colleges. I'm going to read the summary of the bill. Summary, an act to create new section 37-101-450, Mississippi Code of 1972, to provide that the Board of Trustees of State Institutions of Higher Learning shall choose three of the State Institutions of Higher Learning to close by June 30th, 2028 to require the board to announce its decision by June 30th, 2025, to require the board to promulgate factors to be considered in its decision, including enrollment data, degrees offered, economic impact, and any additional purposes that the institution currently serves to the states and its citizens, including providing medical services, agriculture research, or engineering research or services to require the board to host one listening session at the campus of each institution before announcing its decision, to provide that for each state institution that the board closes, such institutions' real property, together with the buildings and any other improvements erected thereon, along with its assets and funds, may be transferred or conveyed to another state agency or political subdivision or sold to a nonprofit entity to provide that any university research or laboratory established within Titles 37, 49, or 57 that is located at an institution that is closed in accordance with this Act may be reestablished with another institution of higher learning as decided by the Board of Trustees of the Institution of Higher Learning to provide the applicable code sections that will be repealed for each institution if the institution is chosen by the Board to be closed and for related purposes. Wow, that's pretty significant. Let's look specifically at section one and what are the basis of <clears throat> the selection. The board shall promulgate factors to be considered in its decision, including but not limited to the following. A, enrollment data and degree attainment percentage. Federal aid, including grants provided for scholarship and research, tuition rates, and scholarship endowments, degrees offered, including graduate degrees and doctorate degrees or other professional degrees, an institution's economic impact on the local community, region, and state, and any additional purposes that the institution currently serves to the states and its citizens, including providing medical services, agriculture research, or engineering research or services, and G, any other special factors the board believes the institution offers that cannot be easily replaced or replicated. Oh, the W enrollment is dramatically in declining. In 2023-2024, there were 159 new students. The year before, the number was in the 120s. So while the enrollment number has gone up, a little bit. It's still one of the third lowest enrollments in the state. It has a 35% graduation rate after four years, making it, again, the third lowest in the state. If we look at tuition, Alcorn State and Delta State are roughly $8,500 a year. MUW is just a little bit more expensive than Mississippi Valley State. Those two are both in the 7,000 range with MVSU um, at 7,400 for tuition and MUW at 7,800 a year for tuition. If we look at what the, the W and the other schools offer, we will find that the biggest case for MUW is that 48% of 
the school a graduation rate is consistent of nursing students. Um, Delta State um, and Alcorn also have nursing programs, but <clears throat> Alcorn offers agriculture, computer science, and significant programs in biology. Whereas there are other pieces that are very similar across the board, uh, MUW, Delta State, and Mississippi Valley State do not offer any of the hard sciences beyond a biology degree uh, compared to computer science and agriculture degrees, which are definitely some of the things that are looked for in that criteria in the bill for a reason to keep the school open. But the greatest thing that the W has going for itself is the nursing program. Delta State's campus seems to be thriving and is co-ed and checks more boxes, except for agriculture engineering, which none of the schools suggested have, um, with the exception of Alcorn. The most significant element the W has going for it is the nursing school again which Mississippi State University could easily absorb if it took on the campus. And this became Mississippi State's Columbus satellite campus. Mississippi Valley State could close because the school's enrollment has fallen the greatest. And due to local college age, high school graduation rates projected in the Delta based on existing reduced birth rates is probably going to be Mississippi Valley State, that's number one on the chopping block. Now, if if the IHL decides to include community colleges in the list of schools to count, to, to, to cut, either Cahoma Community College or Holmes might be on that list if the I, IHL is including community colleges. However, that's not clear. Holmes is still recovering from tornado damages and would be high on my list of suspected schools to close. In my opinion, MUW would be the logical third school for the IHL to look at to close based on the significant decline in enrollment and if there was a mass exodus of alumni support after the re recent renaming debacle. And that leads <clears throat> to an interesting discussion on the long-term replications, repercussions of the W pushing out a new name that discounted any involvement of alumni in its selection process. I know this is jumping around a little bit, but it kind of all ties together in the end. Because if we look at this in and, and the way that the IHL is going to be looking at what schools to close, these are the kinds of elements that they're going to be looking at. One of the things they're going to look at is the reduced involvement of the alumni. <clears throat> With the W pushing out a new name that discounted the involvement of the alumni in its selection process, they ignored the school history and the mission, and they lacked any transparency of process, thus turning the alumni away even more. It would seem the naming community and the directors of marketing and university relations and the president, Nora Miller, took a huge calculated risk in alienating the entire alumni and losing all their goodwill and current and future financial support by that alumni body by not truly including them in the school's significant female-centric groundbreaking history in the process. And <clears throat> the leadership apparently believed they would march into the legislature with their new name get the new name out the door successfully and suddenly attract so many new students and their tuition that their coffers and their classrooms would fill and alumni dollars would then become inconsequential. But the alumni also know how to contact the legislature and they voiced their concerns when they did. They wanted a pause on the renaming and a voice in the process. And now hopefully they will get it. We, the alumni, know it is not just the name that is keeping students from enrolling. It is the campus, it is security, it is lower birth, birth rates, and a host of other reasons. Mostly, 
It's the university's own doings. Should the name be changed? Undoubtedly. But it is not the panacea of changing the name that will cure the school's ills. Let's start with the admissions office. It is but a hollow shell. The director of admissions buys ACT names of students in Mississippi and then apparently does nothing with them other than upload names and emails of the students. They can't even figure out that the ACT scores that they've that they've purchased the connection to, uh, belo- that even those that belong to their pending admits are in that database that they've just uploaded. They don't even begin communicating with students until after they've applied. Good grief. This is just a primordial soup of ineptness. I asked the director of enrollment where they market to students. And his response is, no one knows the W outside of 50 miles of the university. Excuse me, isn't that their job? Marketing the school all over the state? Why not market out of state as well? Why not get the alumni involved in marketing the school at local college fairs, in their communities, in their at the high schools, and at the jun- junior colleges around the country? Why not create a grassroots marketing because it works? But in order to do that, you have to put boots on the ground and they don't or they won't. And they certainly don't want an alumni involved. Why? Because the leadership of the W is grossly incompetent. It's literally the only logical explanation. They have idiots at the helm of the most important gates at the university. Marketing, university relations, enrollment, and the presidency. If Bill 2726 to dissolve three universities or colleges doesn't make it through the legislature this time, the W better get its act together because you know it will come through again especially as long as this is a Republican-controlled legislature. And the W might then be number one on the chopping block and not number three. It's no longer if the W will close due to short-sighted, panic-stricken, reactionary, and secretive leadership. It's when. I want to thank you for coming on Tom Bigby Tales. I'm Shannon Evans, and until next time.